All right. <laughs> Bismillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. Sorry, I'm just going to introduce you. Uh, oh, okay. There's no need. Bismillah. Khair, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Um, I'm so happy to uh, reintroduce, as it were, uh, Imam Muhammad Herbert to come back to kind of finish off our journey that we have taken through the uh, the Prophet Sirah. It's really been exciting to join with Qalam. Uh, and if you remember, uh, Imam Herbert started us off with, you know, when uh, uh, Gibril came to the Prophet in the beginning. And I really, really enjoyed that session of yours. I've actually watched it a number of times in YouTube. And I think people have been doing that where they've been kind of interacting with the recordings uh, and have given us very positive feedback about that. So Imam Muhammad Herbert was actually, comes to us from Texas, but was born and raised in our second home in Baltimore, Maryland. We were just talking about that. Uh, and at the age of 12, he completed Hadith uh, from the Islamic Society of Baltimore. And it just shows you how we just within our own confines, these things are possible if we make them enjoyable, like you know we were just mentioning. And then, uh, as we said, he moved to Irving, Texas to learn Arabic and study at, uh, at Qalam. Uh, and he has been a graduate of the Almiya since 2019 and then moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, where he's currently serving as uh, the youth director and the imam for the community, mashallah. And uh, thank you uh, for joining us again and for you know giving us the final thing, the closing, uh, the hajj and the passing. It says here that this was the beginning of the end, but maybe it would be better to say this was the end of the beginning uh, because there was a lot more, alhamdulillah, that came after as well. Yeah. But I'll, leave, I'll open it up to you, uh, Ya Imam, Jazakallah khair, for gracing us with your ilm. And, um, you know, we'd like to welcome you in person. We've had a wonderful trip with yeah. all of you through this time. And maybe, inshallah, you can join us in person sooner rather than later. It would be a pleasure and an honor. Bismillah, uh, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Allahumma alimna ma infa'na wa infa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma nafi'an. Ya kareem, Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. Uh, first of all, it is a great pleasure to be with all of you here again, alhamdulillah, in uh, the lovely community uh, of Wayland here uh, in, in, in Boston, alhamdulillah, uh, or near Boston-ish, Boston-ish, you got Boston-esque, right? Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, it, it really is a pleasure and an honor, alhamdulillah. Uh, and it's um, it's a bittersweet experience today, guys, right? Uh, as we, you know, come to the end uh, of our class here, um, and and we'll get to that. We'll get to that, inshallah. Anything right that I say is from the teachings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and His Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And anything wrong that I say is from myself and the slip up of Shaytan. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protect us all. Allahumma amin. So in our previous class, we were able to discuss the Battle of Tabuk. Okay, and the Battle of Tabuk is quite a heavy battle. And mashallah, Ustada Khadija was able to, to, to you know, go through that with us all. Alhamdulillah, and we were able to learn uh, 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 what exactly happens in the Battle of Tabuk. And so we'll kind of pick up from right there. So the Battle of Tabuk takes place, right? And the Muslims start coming back from Tabuk in the ninth year, okay? So we are currently in the ninth year after Hijrah, right? So we have obviously the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad that happens. Uh, and then around the second year, we have Badr. In the third year, we have Uhud. And, you know, so many things we've learned, right? We've learned about Khandaq. We've learned about uh, uh, Bi'r Ma'una. We've learned about so many, so many, so many incidents that have happened before the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as well, a pivotal moment in the life of the Prophet Muhammad We've learned about Fath Mecca that happens after this, right? And so I bring up uh, a, a lot of these things because now this is it's all coming up to a culmination right the, the, here it's it's all coming up to you know a peak so to say right and so at the ninth year uh, after hijrah we have the battle of tabuk that takes place now the muslims come back from tabuk in ramadan of this year they come back in ramadan of this year they're coming back and actually subhanallah in this already is a powerful reflection as we're making our way now into this Ramadan uh, uh, here in, in 2023, 
uh, subhanallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he bless us with the honor to reach the month of Ramadan, Allahumma ameen. But as we're making our way into Ramadan, we can sometimes be overwhelmed with this idea of balancing, uh, 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 you know, work and school and worship and this, that and the other. And, and it, it is quite a lot to kind of balance in life, but think that subhanallah, we have so many examples of the Muslims going to battles, going to war in the month of Ramadan. And of course, we have the Battle of Badr, which is the most famous one, but also we have the Battle of Tabuk here that happens, uh, that ends near the Muslims are kind of coming back home, you know, part way through the end of month of Ramadan. But on top of that, Ramadan also marks the close to the end of the year. Okay, and so now the the Muslims they come back. It's now in the middle of Ramadan. They go through Ramadan, and in the month of Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Qa'dah. So just a few months after, a couple months after the month of Ramadan, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sends Abu Bakr as Siddiq to Mecca. He sends Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu to Mecca, and he doesn't send him to Mecca for no reason. He sends him to Mecca with a group of 200 Sahaba. And it is their job to revive and to kind of establish the Hajj principles and the Hajj steps, the Hajj, excuse me, rituals. This serves as kind of a setup to the Hajj of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the year before the Hajj of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sending Abu Bakr and a group of the Sahaba to uh, 200 of the Sahaba to perform the first ever Hajj in Islamic history. This is known as Hajjatul Islam, right? Or Hajjul Islam. This is known as Hajjul Islam, and this is the first ever Hajj in Islamic history where the Prophet Muhammad says Abu Bakr and 200 of the Sahaba. And so they're there, and we said just a moment ago that one of the primary objectives of this Hajj was to kind of set some of the Islamic rituals in place. You see, because the Arabs had been doing Hajj even before Islam, right, uh, based off of some ideas and and based off of some uh, 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 rituals or, or culture that they had that remained from the teachings of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. However, their hajj became very convoluted and very uh, changed uh, uh, and polluted with idol worshipping and things like that. And so Abu Bakr is going to kind of establish some of these things. So you can imagine things like, for example, you know, setting up the place in Mina or establishing the place of Jamarat, right? Or or, you know, setting up the lines in the between Safa and Marwa, right? Where you have, you know, uh, uh, the 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 part in between the valley where you where you run in, right? So these kind of things, these principles, these rituals, and things like that are are being established here now by Abu Bakr as Siddiq anhu, as well as the Sahaba. And so this happens in the ninth year. And of course, as we've kind of already mentioned, this brings us now into the 10th year after Hijrah, the final year that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with us. You know, um, and it's always so bittersweet to, to, to cover this part of the seerah. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize beforehand if I have to, you know, pause as we read through this. Um, it's it's heavy. It's heavy, right? And so we get to the 10th year after Hijrah. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he announces that I'm going to go for Hajj. I'm going for Hajj. The ulama explain that this is now the this is the actualization of the dream of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you guys remember a few classes ago we will have studied the treaty of hudaybiyah and if you remember what what caused the muslims to leave medina to go towards mecca the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a dream and he had a dream that the Muslims went for pilgrimage and they shaved their heads and things like that, right? And so the ulama of seerah and the ulama of tafsir explain that this is now the actualization 
of the dream of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which can be found in Surah Al-Fatih in ayah number twenty-seven, where Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ." Allah subhanahu wa taala has fulfilled the vision of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam بالحق, uh, you know, truthfully. Uh, 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 الْحَرَامَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُوسَكُمْ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ لَا تَخَافُونَ right? You will enter into the sacred mosque and you will shave your heads, right? وَمُقَصِّرِينَ And some of you will shorten your hair. لَا تَخَافُونَ With no fear, right? With complete security, right? Um, آمِنِينَ 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 With full security, right? And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then announces in the month of Dhul Qa'dah of the 10th year. So now we've, we've moved forward. We've moved forward 12 months, right? Uh, 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 in the 10th year, in the month of Dhul Qa'dah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announces that he'll be going for Hajj on the 24th day of Dhul Qa'dah. And so he makes his way towards Mecca and he... Uh, arrives in Mecca on the second of the Hijjah, on the second of the Hijjah. One thing that should be noted, however, is his journey to Mecca was not that lavish. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at this point in his life is getting older, right? At this point in his life, he is in his 60s, 62, 63 years old, right? He's getting much older. As a matter of fact, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates that during the journey to Mecca, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam would pray to Hajjud, he would pray sitting down. He would pray sitting down. That he didn't have the ability to stand at night for the long periods of time that he used to. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum would go with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam for Hajj, and they wanted to you know, make it as luxurious, as, as comfortable as possible. They wanted to serve the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you can imagine, can you imagine if you or I was given the honor to go in a Hajj group like that? Like, I don't know if you guys remember this. It seems like so long ago. But do you remember when, co when COVID happened, right? <laughs> or, you know, maybe some of you guys are, are, are hardcore conservatives, right? And you don't believe COVID ever happened. Uh, <laughs> but if you remember when COVID happened and they shut down all travel to the Haram. And for the first time, for the first time in, in the history that we can remember of our lives, there was no one from America, there was no one from any countries that was going for Hajj, right? And they had a few people from Mecca that they chose specifically to go and do the Hajj practices, right? And then the following year when they opened it up, I mean, till today, it, it is difficult to figure out, you know, or to set up pre-registrations for 2023 20, you know, Hajj, like the Hajj that's coming up this year, it's almost already booked from my knowledge with all of the travel agencies that are going out from the overdue of what they had last year. And so it's like people are just like rushing to go, right? Imagine, imagine if you had a Hajj group with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like, imagine what the sign-up sheet for that would look like, right? I'll tell you what, I'll be the first one to put my name down. Can you imagine a hedge with the Prophet Sallam? And so you have the narrations tell us 30,000 Sahaba. This is an unheard of number in traveling, right? 30,000 Sahaba are now all traveling with the Prophet Muhammad Sallam to go for their hedge. And each of them want to do their best to serve the Prophet. And so some of the Sahaba, they had built this kind of like, uh, like a pillow thing, like a like a seat that he would sit on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on his camel. And so the idea was that this was how the kings would travel at that time, the leaders of Arabia. They would have a camel, uh, and on this camel, they would have like a seat where they could sit on, so it would be comfortable. And then not only that, then they would have a second camel, and the second camel would be dragging their stuff. The idea was, think about if you're taking a road trip. 
If you're taking a road trip, you have to balance how much stuff you're going to put in the car because you need you still need to keep some seats empty for people to sit in. So if you have a, a, a van, for example, and you have, you know, four kids with you and two parents, that's six chairs already being filled up, which means that you can only use the trunk for luggage. So your luggage is much smaller. Now, imagine you had two cars, one car for the people and then one car for the luggage, right? So now you have much more space for luggage. You can put the seats down in the van and you can carry a lot more luggage. So the, 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 the leaders in Arabia, they would do the same exact thing. They would have a camel for themselves and, then, and their personal belongings and things like that, like the important stuff, you know, their passports and things like that. <laughs> and then they would have what? A second camel with all their stuff. And so the Sahaba, they want to set up all of this stuff for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he refuses all of it. He takes off the seat and he says, give it to someone else. And instead he takes his shawl off. You know, you can imagine, you know, like a shawl that you would wear on top, like a scarf, you know, and he takes his scarf, this shawl, and he puts it down and he sits on this. And he sits on this bus. That's it. That's it. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is narrated to have made the dua, Allahumma hajjatun la fakhra fiha. Oh Allah, a hajj with no pride in it, with no boasting in it, with no showing off in it. I share these extra details with you, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. Because it is often the case in our communities, in our families, that we strive to make our religious practices as luxurious as possible. We make our hajj luxurious. We make our umrahs luxurious. We make our salahs luxurious. We make our fasting luxurious. And although there is no inherent blessing in making things extra difficult for yourself, like I'm not sitting here trying to tell you like you need to be hard on yourself. But I am encouraging myself and I am encouraging you to push yourself to strive and to sacrifice for the sake of Allah. And that'll be different for every person because your sacrifice will be based off of the level of luxury that you're accustomed to. Nonetheless, so you have this and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, arrives in Mecca Mukarrama on the second day of al hijjah where he does his tawaf, right? He does his tawaf and after doing his tawaf Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he remains in ihram and he stays in ihram until the eighth day of the hijjah and he starts his hajj as you guys are very well aware hajj begins on the eighth day of the hijjah and the prophet muhammad sallam does umrah plus hajj in one ihram and of course you spend the day in mina on the eighth day of the hijjah and then on the ninth day of the hijjah you pray fajr at mina as the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did and then we go over to arafa and at arafa the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he stood up and he addressed the people in the very famous sermon that is known as khutbatul wida or khutbatu hajj al wida the farewell sermon a very powerful and moving lecture and according to many scholars from the sirah the longest address of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he starts off his address in alhamdulillah all praise belongs to Allah. In a sermon that is very powerful. And if we had the time, it would be a class in and of itself just studying this khutbah. Powerful khutbah. In this khutbah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he speaks about 
he speaks to a number of things. In our class here today, for the sake of time, we will simply be summarizing. But there are a few things that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam speaks about. The first of them, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa starts by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we hear in the khutbah all the time. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu, right? Wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Right? We hear this uh, right? in some narrations. And after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He reminds the people to be conscious of Allah. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullah. O oh, you who believe what? Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And he reads some ayat from the Quran. After which, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asks a question. He asks a question. And I want you to imagine, you're sitting there at the base of the mountain of Arafah. According to some narrations, a hundred and 20,000 Sahaba there. 120,000 Sahaba. And you're sitting there. You're wearing your ihram. If you're a man, you're wearing your two white uh, towels. If you're a woman, you're sitting there, you're, you're in your normal clothes. And you're seeing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's standing on, uh, uh, you know, and he's addressing the people. And he asks you, what is the nature of this day? What is the nature of this day and this month and this place? And the Sahaba replied, Ya Rasulullah, we are in a sacred place, in a sacred time, on a sacred day. Think about the sanctity for Muslims that we have for the day of Arafah. The sanctity of the day of Arafah. The sanctity of the month of the Hijjah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that there is no good deed that you can do that is more beloved to Allah than a good deed that you do in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And the Sahaba asked him, they said, Ya Rasulullah, even jihad? Even jihad? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, even jihad except the only exception is that person who leaves their house for jihad and they, they die, meaning they leave everything. They sacrifice all of their wealth and they sacrifice their life and they come back with nothing. That person who dies in jihad after having sacrificed everything is better. That is the only deed that is better than any other deed. Just like reading Quran, like any random deed done in the 10 days of the Hijjah. So the month is sacred. Then the day of Arafah is even more sacred, as we are all very, very well aware. And then on top of all of that, you have the sacredness, the sanctity of the place itself. The sanctity of the place itself. The mountain of Arafah itself. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, after the Sahaba respond, that this is a sacred time, on, in a sacred place, in a sacred day. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he responds, the life, the property, the dignity, of every single Muslim is more sacred than this. Your fellow Muslim brother or sister, their property, their dignity, their life, their blood is more sacred than this. And so now we think about that as we might want to cheat one another in business as we slander one another as we insult one another we make fun of one another that 
it is more offensive that we harm each other as Muslims than if we were to disrespect that day, that time, that place. This is one of the most powerful lessons. I told you guys this, this khutbah to al-wada. I mean, we could do a whole class just on this khutbah. The sanctity of the believer. Subhanallah, it seems as though today, in the eyes of the Muslim, other Muslims is the cheapest thing. That we're so quick to insult one another. Oh, look at this person from this country. Look at this person from that country. These people act this way. Those people act this way. We insult one another. We backbite one another. We cheat one another. We lie to one another. We, we cross one another. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us what? The sanctity of the Muslim. The next thing the Prophet Muhammad speaks about sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is about interest and usury, right? And how interest is haram. Uh, the next thing that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about is not playing with the time and months. The Arabs would have a practice that they recognized that certain months were sacred, like for example, Ramadan or Dhul Hijjah or something like this. And let's say, for example, Ramadan came and you weren't really in the mood of fasting and this, this and the other, or you know, you had other business things that you wanted to do. What you would do is you would kind of like erase Ramadan on the calendar and you say, oh, no, it's not Ramadan. It's actually Sha'ban, right? And so they would move the months around like this. Uh, as a way to kind of avoid responsibility on these sacred days. So the Prophet ﷺ warns the Muslims of, of, of doing this action. He explains how time is sacred in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ speaks about, and this is something that is near and dear to my heart, uh, as something that I see, subhanAllah, our communities have failed at this across the world. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he says, O oh people, ya ayyuhan nas, istawsu bin nisa'i khayra. Your women folk have a right upon you. Take care of the women in your community. Take care of the women in your community. Take care of the women in your community. That is your right. That is your responsibility as men. It is the right of the women in our communities to feel safe, to feel protected without having to do anything. That is the right that Allah gave them. This is why Allah subhanahu wa says, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّامُونَ عَلَى nisa." Right? That the men, it is their responsibility to take care of, to, to, to guard, to protect to save the women in our communities. But subhanAllah, so much oppression that happens. So much oppression that happens. We have oral abuse that is happening, verbal abuse that is happening. We have physical abuse that is happening in our communities. We have just different levels of harm that's happening. Now, this is not to say, my dear brothers and sisters, that women don't abuse men. I know it goes both ways, that there are some women that abuse men as well. And if you are being abused, then please definitely uh, go uh, and seek proper help from the authorities, whether that be a psychiatrist, whether that be a counselor, whether that be a therapist. However, although it does happen that women abuse men, the overwhelming majority in the world, and especially in America, is that men abuse women. Right? And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, makes it very clear. You have been entrusted by Allah to take care of the women in your community. Right? The next thing the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he speaks about is that there is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab. There is no difference between white or black except in taqwa. La farqa bayna arabiyyin wa a'jamiyyin illa bit taqwa, right? That there is no difference between any of us. 
It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter if you're darker or lighter. It doesn't matter if you're from Pakistan or India. It doesn't matter if you're from Jordan or Palestine. It doesn't matter if you're from Morocco or Algeria. It doesn't matter where you are from. There is no difference between any of us except in taqwa. There's no difference except in taqwa. This racism needs to be eliminated from our communities. Racism, colorism as well. How many of us come from, you know, cultures where if someone has lighter skin, they're considered more beautiful. To the point where we have sometimes people in our communities that will bleach their skin just so that they look more beautiful in the sight of others. Can you imagine? What a disgrace. How do we answer to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How do we answer, more importantly, to Allah Azza wa Jal? How do we stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he concludes his khutbah by saying, O people, O mankind, I have left you with two treasures. I have left you with two treasures, the Qur'an from Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You will find all the answers to life in these sources. These are our sources as Muslims. And so we go back to them. And this is how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concludes Khutbatul Wida. Now you can imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is standing there, right? And he's addressing 120,000 Sahaba. Right? And so this is the day of Arafah. And of course, as you guys are very well aware, after Arafah is what? Muzdalifa. And after Muzdalifa, we go back to Mina and we have the Jamarat. And then, you know, we have the shaving of our heads and the slaughtering. And then we're going to go back for the Jamarat. And then we have uh, uh, Tawaful Izara, the Tawaf in the middle of the Hajj. And then we have Tawaful Wida or Tawaful, uh, uh, all the steps of Hajj. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he continues through all of the steps of Hajj. And he completes his Hajj, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He reaches back home to Medina right after he finishes Hajj. So right after he finishes Hajj, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he doesn't stay in Mecca for many months or something like that. Very quickly, he goes back to Medina after finishing his Hajj. And he oversees the community there in Rabi' al-Awwal, in Muharram and in Safar, you know, in the first couple of months, the first two months that he's there uh, uh, in Medina. And in the 11th year after Hijrah, the final few months that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with us. The ahadith tell us that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had between 14 and 18 white hairs in his beard. 14 or 18. I want you to appreciate the love that the Sahaba had for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi They would sit there and they would count. One, two, three. Yeah. In the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, which is the third month of the Arabic calendar, in the 11th year after Hijrah, on and around the fifth day of the month, Around the fifth day of the month, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to feel very ill. And he asked his freed slave, Abu Muwayhiba, to take him to Jannatul Baqiyah, to escort him to the graveyard behind Masjid al-Nabawi. Of course, Jannatul Baqiyah, that is there until today. And he requested Muwayhiba radiallahu ta'ala anhu to assist him. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he looks out at Baqir. This is Sunday night. 
Sunday night, the fifth of Rabi' al awwal He looks out at Baqi' and he says, Assalamu alaykum. He says, Salam. O oh, inhabitants of the grave, you are in a much better place than us. The fitan, the trials and tribulations are coming. They will be more disorienting than the darkest night. Meaning the tests that are coming in the future will be more disorienting than the darkest night. Imagine you're out in the dark in the middle of the night and you spin around five times and someone asks you, which way is north, which way is south, which way is east? East, You wouldn't know. And so the Prophet Muhammad says the fitnas that are coming are going to be this bad. The tests that are coming will be this bad. One will follow after the other. And each one that comes will be worse than the one that came before it. In another narration, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says a sign of the end of times that it will be like a holding on to a hot coal. You know, if you do barbecue, uh, you have the coals. Imagine holding on to a hot coal. Prophet says that holding on to your deen will be like holding on to that hot coal. That will be difficult. You'll find yourself in positions where you will do many things to try to fit in with the people around you. You might, dre you might dress differently just to be accepted in your society. You might abandon certain beliefs to be accepted in your society. You might talk differently to be accepted into your society. You might change things to be perceived as normal in your society. That the tests will come and they will be heavy. They will be heavy and each test that come will be harder than the one that came before. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says this what? At Jannatul Baqiyah. And he looks to Muwayhiba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he says, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that he was given a choice. He could enjoy the life of this world until the end of time. Or he could depart from this world and be with his Lord. And Abu Muwayhiba radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he begged him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, choose this world. Stay with us. And the Prophet Muhammad says, no. I've chosen to be with Allah. It has been mentioned that the next morning, which is Monday morning, the 6th of Rabi' al-Awwal, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he led Fajr prayer. When he returned, he began to experience fatigue, pain, and headaches. His, uh, uh, he, his sickness, his illness was getting worse. He was in the home of his wife, Maymuna, radiallahu ta'ala anha, before the dhuhr prayer. And he prays dhuhr and asr. But by the evening time, his fever and his condition got worst so quickly that he requested uh, uh, Maymuna radiallahu ta'ala anha she said Ya Maymuna is it okay with you if I spend the rest of the day and if I go until I get better in the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Maymuna says absolutely and so the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi he goes into the house of his wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and he stays there and he's feeling ill his condition worsening moment after moment at the time of isha prayer the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sickness has gotten so bad that he could not even stand up on his own and so he called for his nephews ali his cousins i'm sorry ali anhu and fadl radiyallahu anhu fadl is the son of Abbas, 
Fadl bin Abbas. So he calls for his cousins. And you know, his cousins, subhanAllah, they're much younger than him, right? When you think cousins, the Prophet and Ali are cousins, right? It's not like a difference of 10 or 15 years or something. The Prophet وسلم, is at least 30 years older than, than Ali, radiallahu ta'ala. at least 30 years, right? And so Ali is much younger, right? You can imagine Ali, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, is in his 30s at this point, right? He's at, he's in his, uh, I'm sorry, he's probably in, uh, 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 yeah, he's probably been in, in his 40s around this time, right? His 30s or 40s. And so he calls for Ali and he calls for Fadl and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he puts his arms, right, around them and they pick up the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on their shoulders, right? And they drag the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Musalla, to Masjid al-Nabawi. As you know, the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was only separated from the Masjid by a curtain. So you can imagine you had like a rectangle that was Masjid al-Nabawi and around Masjid al-Nabawi was like these little rooms. And these rooms were the houses of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And between the, 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 the Masjid and the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just a curtain was just a curtain. And so, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is dragged in for the Isha Salat by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And his illness had gotten so bad that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, could not even pray standing. And so he led the prayer sitting down. He led the prayer sitting down. The illness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam continued to worsen over the next few days. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's skin got so hot that you could barely even touch it. That if you touched it, you would burn yourself. That his fever was so hot. The wives of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would use wet clothes to cool him down. They would take a cloth and they would put it in water and they would put it on his head. They would put it on his body to try to cool him down. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, requested that Aisha anha, keep a cool bowl of water nearby as his eyes used to burn. وسلم, so he would put, pick up some water and he would wash his eyes. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was in so much pain that he could no longer sit up by himself. Yet he still insisted on praying with the community. He still insisted. It has been narrated by different sahaba including Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the feet of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they gave out, like he couldn't walk anymore. And so when the sahaba would take him into the masjid, before he was kind of like using them as a crutch, but now, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his feet would drag on the floor behind him. On Thursday morning, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa attempted to sit up in bed so that he could perform wudu for the Fajr prayer. And even with the help of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he was not able to sit up all the way. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asked her to hurry up to the masjid and to tell her father to lead the salah. When the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum gathered at the masjid, Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu had not yet arrived. And so they had told, they had tried to push Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Umar, go lead, go lead, go lead. And Umar was hesitant. But he steps forward. And the moment he steps forward, uh, what? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu yells out, no, wait for Abu Bakr. Wait for Abu Bakr. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, eventually he came, right? He eventually came. Uh, and it has been mentioned that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu then led the salah on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Three days, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq anhu is leading all of the salahs in Masjid al-Nabawi. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum were deeply concerned, but it had never crossed their mind 
that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, could die, could pass away. How? How could this happen? This couldn't happen. On Sunday, Abu Bakr anhu led Fajr and Dhuhr. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, called for Aisha and Hafsa anhuma, to bring seven buckets of water. He asked them to pour the water over him. When they did, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he opened his eyes and he sat up by himself, something he hadn't been able to do for the past week. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Fadl radiallahu ta'ala anhu entered with the Prophet. They went and they go and they pick up the Prophet sallam, just as they have been for the past few days. And the Prophet sallam, is dragged into the masjid and this is where he can see Abu Bakr leading the prayer. And Abu Bakr senses the presence of the Prophet. You know, you can you can hear, right? The Prophet is being dragged in, right? And the uh, and Abu Bakr is ready to step back to let the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, lead. And the Prophet وسلم, what gestures to him? No, you stay, you lead, you lead, you lead. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sits behind and he prays behind Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. After the Salat, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addresses the Sahaba and he began with the praise and glorification of Allah. He then made extensive dua for them. He made extensive dua for the Sahaba. And he asked the forgiveness of Allah Jalla Jalalu. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam also reminded them, be good to the Ansar guys, be good to the Ansar, the people of Medina, right? as they were there to protect him when no other people were there. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the slave a choice, this world or the hereafter. And many of the Sahaba understood this to be in figurative. The Prophet Muhammad has spoken about this so many times before. But Abu Bakr as Siddiq, anhu, he hears this and he begins to cry. He begins to cry uncontrollably. So much so that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi needed to call him down. He said, Ala rislika ya Abu Bakr. Hold yourself, ya Abu Bakr. Hold yourself, ya Abu Bakr. After this gathering, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was escorted home. And the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala would later realize that this was the farewell of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba began to visit the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Sunday afternoon. And they came to visit and visit and they would, you know, sit there uh, uh, and they would, you know, be with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And on Sunday evening, only the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi surrounded him, his wives, his uncles, his aunts and cousins. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates, he says, Sunday evening, it was just the family. And as the whole family was there, everyone was there. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam's eyes were locked on the door. Everyone was there. Ali, Abu Bakr, you know, Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Fadl ibn Abbas. All the uncles, the cousins, the wives, everyone was there. The family was all there around the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but his eyes were locked on the door. And who opens the door as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is looking there? None other than his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha walks through. Fatima walks through the room and she takes her father's hand and she begins to cry. 
as she's crying, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brings her close and he whispers into her ear. And upon hearing his words, she began to cry. And then he calls her again and he whispers again. And through her tears, the Sahaba said, we saw her smile. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. She bid her father farewell and she kisses his hand. This would be the last time Fatima anha saw her father alive, the Prophet Muhammad. After this incident, Aisha anha would ask Fatima, What did the Prophet Muhammad tell you? And Fatima said that the first time he whispered in my ear, he told me that he's returning to Allah. And the second time he whispered in my ear, he told me that I would be the first from his family to meet him in Jannah. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he mentions that after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was as if Fatima had died as well. That when her father died, it's as if she died as well. That she was just walking through this world with no emotions, nothing. And she ends up passing away six months after her father. It has been mentioned that the night before, Sunday night, Sunday night, that no one slept. The Sahaba عنهم, all remained in the masjid throughout the night. They were all worried. And they awaited the arrival of the Prophet. They're sitting there in the masjid, worried, scared. Waiting for the Prophet وسلم, to step outside of his home like, oh, I'm better now. From the apartment of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha opened the curtain and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiled at the Sahaba and then she closed the curtain. That would be the last time that the Sahaba saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alive. On Monday morning, after Fajr prayer, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to experience trouble breathing. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates that she pulled her arms against her chest like he, she she pulled him into her arms against her chest so you can imagine the head of the Prophet ﷺ is here and Aisha pulls the head of the Prophet ﷺ and his body against her chest as she does this her brother Abdul Rahman the uh, the son of Abu Bakr Siddiq right her brother Abdul Rahman walks in and when he saw them, he apologized for disturbing and he was ready to walk out. However, before he walked out, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu pointed at his shirt, right? He pointed at his shirt. Abdul Rahman used to carry a miswak in his shirt. Uh, you know, the, the miswak, the siwak, uh, the toothbrush in his shirt. And so he gives it to the Prophet Sallallahu and Aisha takes it and she chews on it and she makes it soft. And she gives it to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, takes it and he brushes his teeth. And in a very weak voice, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he then looks and he says, take care of your salah, take care of your salah, take care of your salah and be good to the people in your care. 
Yani Allah has put you guys all responsible of someone. As we know in another hadith, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyatih. Every single one of you is a shepherd and every single one of you is responsible for your flock. And so the Prophet وسلم, here at this moment, he says what? Take care of your salah. Take care of your salah. Take care of your salah. And be good to the people in your care. Do not oppress anyone. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha She narrates That at that moment The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Looked up to the heavens and he said Allahumma ila rafiq al-a'la Allahumma ila rafiq al-a'la O oh Allah To the highest companion and friend A rafiq right? A rafiq meaning friend or companion Meaning ya Allah Take me, take me to you, take me to you, my friend, my companion. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates that she felt the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exhale deeply on her chest. And then she watched his hands fall to the side. And on that Monday morning, on the 12th day of Rabi'ah al-Awwal, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returns to Allah And this is the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to leave you guys with one parting piece of advice as our time here has come to an end. Shortly after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr is appointed as the leader of the Muslim community. Abu Bakr went into the masjid and he called Bilal. And he said, Ya Bilal, call the Adhan. And Bilal is crying. And through his tears, he's calling the Adhan. And the Muslims gathered there. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq addresses the Muslims and he recites an ayah from the Qur'an. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِمْ مَاتًا أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيَّا That this is an ayah in Surah Al Imran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is nothing but a messenger. قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ Messengers have come before him. أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ If he was to die or if he was killed, would you revert back to your old ways? وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا and whoever turns back on their heels, whoever goes back to their old ways, will not hurt Allah in any way, shape, or form. He then said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa innahu qad mat. Wa man kana ya'budu Allah fa innahu hayyu la yamut. Whoever from amongst you worship the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And he has died But whoever worships Allah Then Allah is all living حيون, He is, never dies La yamut. He is hay, He is forever alive And he never dies And so as we sit here And we are sad to read through the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Even though we already knew <laughs> Ajeeb man Ajeeb situation You know It still hurts the heart to read through it Every time I read through it It feels like It feels like we've lost it again We've lost him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again 
But I remind myself and I remind all of you that as Muslims, we have now studied the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was but a messenger with a message. More important than the messenger was the message itself. And that message was to worship none other than Allah Azza And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he fulfilled his duty. Adda al-amana. He taught you and I how to be Muslims. He did this and he did this excellently, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we've learned in his life. Now the question arises, you and I, we have the message. It's in front of us. Will we follow or will we not? Will we follow or will we not? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from a people that follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us all in the highest level of Jannah, neighboring the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. I remind you all of the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a parting advice. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, I can't wait to meet my brothers and sisters. And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, are we not your brothers and sisters? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, no. You are my companions. My brothers and sisters are those who believed in me and never even saw me. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us from these people. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala unite us all in the highest level of Jannah, neighboring the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakumullah khairan for your time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam and, and uh, uh, jazakallah imam. I know that we wanted to have some questions, but but I'm not sure how you're going to ask questions. So it's, it's, um, um, I'm, I, as you mentioned, uh, just reading through and listening through uh, was, was fairly emotional. Uh, but again, if anybody has a question, uh, then please uh, go ahead. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I would take this time uh, and and uh, the, you can either type the question or you can unmute yourself and then that way you can ask. Uh, but while you are thinking or about it, just, um, I, I just wanted to, to thank you, uh, especially to get us started and then and, and that uh, uh, the last and final session uh, tonight, uh, as well as everybody from um, Alam Institute, please uh, convey our Islamic Center's gratitude and thanks to them and Jazakallah Khair uh, to all of them uh, for... Um, for, for a beautiful series uh, and uh, those who have uh, watched tonight's program and not earlier programs uh, these are available on youtube um, uh, there is a special um, actually we it is icb valent channel and we have created a, uh, a special uh it's called the uh, uh the playlist actually that's what it's called uh, for, for this program so you don't have to even search individually just go to the playlist looking for this uh, sira series program and inshallah you'll find all of those there so um, I don't see anything typed and I don't see anybody unmute. So I'm assuming there are no questions uh, as a guest. Uh, so once again, Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. And inshallah, as Faisal said at the beginning, uh, we love to uh, uh, to have you over at our center, uh, inshallah, in the future. And I'm personally looking forward to more programs with Qalam Institute, inshallah. Sure. And uh, for others, um, uh, the, the founder of, of, of Qalam uh, will be our chief guest, uh, the, the keynote speaker. Uh, on March 4th, uh, which is Saturday, it's our fundraiser dinner also. Uh, coincidentally, we we actually had him scheduled uh, two years ago before COVID started. <laughs> and and we, we could never have him because that was in April. And, and before that, the center closed and everything. But Alhamdulillah, he's agreed to come back. And we're trying to see if we can have an extended program with him that weekend. But um, but I know he, he has to be back. So uh, back for, for running his program. So inshallah. So keep that in mind. It's um, uh, the information about the program is on our website. The emails have gone out, but if you're still uh, uh, unable to find that, please uh, feel free to uh, contact me or anybody from the board, uh, inshallah, and they will be able to provide you information about the program. Uh, so the Khalam Institute uh, founder Imam uh, Jangda would be here, inshallah, on March fourth. And Imam Herbert, thank you so much again. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.